نصلي على رسوله الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وجعل لي وزيرا من أهلي ربي يسر ولا توسر وتمم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح ربي زدني علما ربي حبلي حكما وألحكني بالصالحين ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا ذاب النار ربنا لا تزك قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوحاب السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ بائی دا گریس اینڈ توفیق آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ آئی نمبر ہنڈریڈ اینڈ تھری آف سورہ علی عمران اینڈ ویل گو اوور دا ریسائٹیشن اینڈ دا میننگ ورڈ بائی ورڈ میننگ فرسٹ سو اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, wa tasimu. Wa is and. E a tasimu, hold on tightly to something. Ayn, sawad, and mean. Is, so it's like to hold on tight to something. So wa tasimu, and hold on tightly. Hold on for dear life. Bi hablillah. To the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Habl is rope. And we're going to talk about, obviously, uh, in more depth about these words. Bi hablillah. To the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jami'an. All of you. And the another, another the two meanings here of Jamian, all of you all together, hold on to the rope of Allah and also hold on to the rope of Allah all together, all of it, meaning the rope of Allah, all of it. So there are two ways this has been interpreted, that Jamian goes back to the rope of Allah and Jamian can also go back to those who are holding it, that all of you hold it together or the one uh, of each one of us, when you're holding to the rope, hold on to all of the rope of Allah. Don't let go of all of it and hold on to it with dear life. Wala tafarraku. Wa and la do not. La, like we say, la ilaha illallah. La means no. So wa la and do not tafarraku. Firka is a division, something that, that gets divided, like farak, even we say in Urdu, right? Tafarraku to, to divide, like do not. So wala tafarraku and do not be divided, right? So do not be divided in, in, in anything and hold on to the. Uh, rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of you together to the whole of the rope of Allah. Wadguru. Wadguru, wa is and. Udguru, to remember. Right? Dhakara, to remember. So wadguru and remember. And what are we going to remember? Bin, um, be, um, sorry. Uh, wadguru, ni'matallahi. Ni'ma is the favor, the blessing. The ni'matallahi, the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alaykum. Allah and kum. Kum refers to all of you, the plural of you. So all of you and Allah is upon. So alaykum becomes on you. So remember the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of you. Idh kuntum. Idh is when. And what is the difference between idh and idha? Both sound very similar. And in translation, whenever we look at the English translation, we, it will say the word when. right? But one is referred to when in the past. When this happened. Remember when this happened? And that is is. And when we say when, as in the future, you know, when uh, she comes, give her this book from me. Or when uh, when you go there, then do this, right? So that when is for the future, that is idha. Okay. So um, uh, is here is referring to when, as in the past. Remember the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of you when kuntum you were adha and from adu. And adu is for an enemy. Ada and when you were enemies, like the plural, when you were enemies, remember the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of you when all of you were enemies to each other, meaning for then 
uh, or so. Allafa uh, is that to put ulfat in something, to to put love and friendship and camaraderie in something. So for allafa, then he made friendship. He put love in your hearts. He he put friendship, right? Baina kulubikum. Uh, in between, kulub is the plural of kalb, and kalb, as we know, is the heart, right? So we make the dua, ya muqallib al kulub. Thabit qalbi ala dine kita. Oh, oh, the turner of hearts. Turn our heart. So Kulub is the heart, right? The Kalb is a singular. And why is the Kalb called the Kalb? The meaning of literal meaning of Kalb is something that turns a lot, right? And so what is the heart? The heart by nature turns a lot. And that's why we ask Allah SWT, Ya Mukallib al the one who controls the heart, who controls the turning of the heart that uh, keep my heart firm on your faith, right? So for Allah fa bayna Kulubikum, then he made friendship between your hearts. He put friendship, he put love, he put camaraderie between your hearts, all of your hearts. For us, then you became uh, by his favor, Ikhwanan, Ikhwanan brothers. So there are two very similar words. Ikhwa, uh, Ikhwa refers to brothers by blood, and Ikhwana, uh, Ikhwan, uh, that refers to the word, uh, the brothers by uh, something common in between like spirituality like religion or some common cause or something so you become you became brothers like that wa kuntum and you were ala upon shafa on the brink of like to literally to the edge of something khufratin khufratin is a pit like like for example we can imagine like there's a there's a huge mountain or there's a huge like uh, cliff and somebody is right at the edge like Shafa is like right at the edge of that pit, Minan Nari. And in at the bottom of the pit, there is fire. So what you all were at the brink of that, uh, you were literally at the edge of this, um, this cliff and you were about to fall into this pit of fire. You were right at the edge. For uh, Then he saved you. He saved all of you, Minha, from it, meaning from the fire. He saved all of you from the fire. Kadalika. Thus, Yubayinu Allahu, Yubayinu, uh, from Bayina, Bayin, like to make something clear, right? So Yubayinu Allahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes clear, lakum, for all of you, ayatihi, his ayat, his verses, his signs, la'allakum, so that you, tahtadun, from hidayat, uh, uh, so it became, tahtadun, so that all of you may be guided. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that, Hold fast, all of you, to the cord of Allah, to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and do not be divided. And do not be divided. Remember the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. When you were enemies to each other, he brought your hearts together so that you may become brothers uh, through his blessing. And you were at the brink of the pit of a fire, then he saved you from it. This is how Allah makes his sign clear to you so that you may take the right path. So this is one ayah, but it has several concepts in it. If we, if we look at that, one is like you hold on fast uh, uh, to the book, or hold on for dear life, hold on for your dear life to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not be divided, right? And then remember the blessings of Allah. Uh, then remember when you were enemies to each other, you he brought your hearts together and you became brothers through his blessing. Then you were at the brink of the pit of the fire and he saved you from it. And then this is how Allah makes his signs clear to you so that you may take the right path. Now, all these, like if we look at different other places in the Quran, all these parts of different parts of this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made them separate ayat too, right? And, and at several places we find that one small concept or one just a couple of words or three words or four words, they make a whole ayah. Right? But here this whole thing is one ayah and which kind of like some scholars bring uh, attention to this point is that we, we need to study it all together. When, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put something as an ayah and these divisions of ayat were made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, the divisions of the juz have been done by, by us, by human beings for the sake of uh, the ability to read the Quran because previous generations before us, um, there are different ways that we divide the Quran. Like we know that one is the juz or the separa, all right? One is the surah. The, the names of the surahs and then uh, the ayat, right? So the division of the juz or the separa that were made by people before us, like after after the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because they wanted to finish the Quran in one month. They wanted to read the Quran in one month. So they wanted to have portions so that, okay, how much should we read in one day, one week, one day so that we can finish 
uh, recitation of the Quran in one month, right? That was their goal. Or uh, even if they want to do it in two months or three months, they know how much to portion it. Like, okay, this much we'll read in one week. Let's say somebody says, okay, in one sibara, I'll read it in one week. So I need to read this many pages. It's like if you look at Uthmani Musa, for example, it comes to approximately 20 pages. Um, uh, for purge. So somebody might say, okay, I want to read in one week 20 pages. If I'm reading like uh, five days, then I, I need to read four pages every day. Then I'll be able to finish one one separa in one week. Like you can divide it, right? But the ayat, the the division of the ayat is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And when he's made these ayat, it's it kind of uh, helps us to uh, bring home the point that we should study the whole the all the concepts together and inshallah they will make more more sense to us and also um, in the study of ayat we know we look at the ayat before and ayat after as well um, but uh, and, and there's a there's a link to the previous ayat and next ayat, but those are other studies but just for this ayat what we're looking at is that we need to look at all of these concepts together and how how they teach us a whole lesson when we when we look at all of them together right so Earlier we, we learned about we were learning about that uh, there were different enemies who were trying to the 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 time of revelation of these ayat. We were learning that there was uh, a group of Muslims who were sitting together. They were um, they were brothers now. They they used to have fight between them, but they're brothers now in faith and everything. They're sitting together having time, and uh, there was an attempt made to create a rift between them, and they, it almost led to war. But uh, Alhamdulillah, it was saved, right? And then Allah Ta'ala is teaching us through these ayat, like we learned last time as well, how to protect ourselves from our enemies. And the enemies will exist all the time. How do we protect ourselves? So Allah Ta'ala is giving us literally tools to protect ourselves. He's giving us tools for protection for ourselves, for our families, for our uh, communities. And we, they, there'll always be attacks from all sides, right? So what he says is, uh, the first thing that Allah Ta'ala tells us is, Wa atasimu. from ayin saw then mean, like to hold something tightly. And like um, and and the letter ta in between is meant here for exaggeration. Like there, there's a there's a shiddat in it. There's a lot of exaggeration in it. Like hold on such that you hold on so tight that you're afraid that you you literally have that fear that you don't want to let it go, right? And um, when so for example when there is a danger of something and we hold on to something so tight um, that uh, we we fear that like we will we will lose our protection if we, if we let if somehow this hold becomes loose then i'll be lost right so it's like the person so for example uh, one example is given by is like that let's say there are two people riding on a horse and one of the person in front he knows how to ride but there is a person sitting behind who does not know how to ride now this person who does not know how to ride but he's sitting behind the person he's going to hold on the person to the person in front of him with all his might because if he lets go he's going to fall because he does he doesn't know how to ride or a person who doesn't know how to ride a bike let's say in today's times right and there is a person sitting behind and there's a person in front and the person in front is riding and everything the person behind has never sat on the bike before and then it can be a bit like scary okay i don't want to fall down and everything we're going on such a high speed and here so the person behind holds on tightly to the person in front that okay i don't want to fall and uh, right so uh, the 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 concept here is from uh, from ein sod and meme is to hold on to something really really tight right it's not like loose kind of a thing it is it's a very tight grip and there's a lot of like um, a mindful grip and a very tightly uh, held grip in that sense that we hold on tightly to that right so last ayah we learned about taqwa that allah subhanahu told us about taqwa that our taqwa will save us from the enemies and now allah is teaching us something that you hold on tightly right to uh, to the uh, to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the effect that people I'm leaving behind me such a deen that its nights are as um, as lit as its mornings, right? And obviously I'm paraphrasing this is to the effect that that whose nights are as as bright as its day, meaning like everything in the deen is very clear. So we can't say that there is anything that the Prophet Sallallahu um, has or told us which he did not open up and explain to us. He explained everything to us. Only sometimes if we don't understand things, we just need to look further or keep asking Allah Ta'ala will open that door for us. But inshallah, it is it is, it is there. Uh, and he said that you hold on to this um, 
this beam tightly with your molars, with your with your side teeth, not with your um, front teeth. Like if you hold, and if you think of like this, if you imagine the, there's a lot of imagery in this ayah too. Like if you imagine like there's a rope that we are holding onto, and let's say our hands are tied or something, and we are holding it on from our mouth. We have that rope, and we ho we need to hold on tight to it to save ourselves. If we hold it on from our front teeth, then the teeth might break, right? As uh, and you might lose the teeth or everything, and then we might you lose the grip, and we might not be able to hold on to the thing because they're they're weak. The front teeth are weak, but the side teeth, the molars, they they are they're pretty strong, right? So we uh, so what we are told is hold on tightly, meaning first of all like get, have the uh, the tight hold and have it like through your through your back teeth, like hold on so tight that the grip is like strong and uh, firm. Right. And another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ told us that I'm leaving behind uh, in, be in, um, in between you uh, to the effect that in between you, I'm, I'm leaving behind two things. And if you hold on to them tightly, then you will never, ever go astray. If you hold on to those two things very, very tightly. And what are those two things? The book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. So the book of Allah, the Quran. So and, and if you make the Quran a part of our life, the Quran, the part of our, um, you know, like our our learning, our like lifestyle on how we're going to live our life and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The more and more we try to learn about him, his life, how he dealt with different situations and uh, what he did ask us to do, what was his practice? What did how did he do this? How did he do this? How did he behave with his family? What was his role as a husband? How did he fulfill his role as a husband? How did he fulfill his role as a father? Right. Like, for for example, we learn little, little traditions which are like um, which kind of give us an insight into his character that when his daughter would come into the room, he would stand up and greet her and everything. And then he would give a little um, uh, little kiss on her forehead. OK, and he would say, come here, like meaning he would show love to um, to his children and uh, he would he would welcome them right whenever he would, they would come and everything. And uh, he was responsible, like he would check on every every evening and he had multiple households. He had multiple wives and it was divided at like this, like later on in his life in Medina, he had multiple wives and then every uh, every day it was a different wife's turn that he would spend the day. Uh, so he, he would spend the night in that house and then the next day would be another wife's turn and everything. And yet what he would do is Every evening he would visit each of his wives and despite and this is despite him being a prophet of Allah, despite him being the leader of the state. So we can imagine he was a mayor and a, uh, you know, like a, a, the mayor of the city and he was like the governor of the province and he was the prophet of Allah all at the same time. People are coming all the time to ask him questions. He is receiving wahi. He has his own worship to do. He has his own. He's a human being, so he, he has his own physical needs, sleep and food and everything else, and he has to pray and he has to do all those other things. He has to keep himself fit. He has to travel so much. He has to go and fight in the battles. He has to take care of the city's issues like the the, you know, like all kinds of things crop up and we know as as a mayor or as a governor, you have to deal with the law. You have to make sure things are uh, correct and he would and he would go and help people as well and he would do different things. At the same time, he would not neglect his duties as a husband, as a father. So what he would do is and he didn't have to go to every wife's house on that in the evening because he was this. This is this wife's turn, so he has to go to this wife's house. Yet he would go in the evening and check on each of his wives. OK, or do you have everything you need? Is there anything you need help for or anything? And he would go and help and everything. Right. And um, another thing we know is that uh, and we know these from the mothers from our mothers, the mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They told us that when he was in the house, he would be busy serving uh, his family. He would keep doing things for his family and everything. He would um, you know, he would be helping all of us and in different chores and different things and everything. But when the time of prayer ca came, he would be like a stranger. He would meaning like that time he would just like cut off and go straight to the prayer. Like it was like, OK, time for prayer. Everything drops, right? So it was that was his character. That was his thing. So and we learn so much and, and this is just one aspect of his life. But when we look at different aspects of his life on how he did, how how he romanced with his wife, how he took care of his children, how he was with, with his friends, uh, with Abu Bakr, how he advised his uh, friends, how would how he was as a leader. And everything he he led from the front. Like when so, whenever we are in charge of something, 
how do we behave that when we are following something how do we behave that right so different things we learn from um, uh, the book of allah and from his life also the the seerah of the prophet is deeply uh, you know like it's like you cannot study the quran uh, without the seerah of the prophet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed as such the different ayat of the quran came down at the different um, you know like uh, what is the asbab in uzul like what, what is the time that this ayah came down to study that ayat we'll have to look at the context what was going on in the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahabas, what happened? Somebody came and asked a question. This question was asked and this ayah was revealed. Or this was going on, people did this and this and this ayah was revealed. Right. So it's like when we study the ayat of the Quran, we almost relive that part or we are we are our attention is put back into that aspect or that incident or something from the life of the Prophet ﷺ and it's there inseparable and even our whole deen if you look at it um, these two things are inseparable la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah you cannot be a muslim until you say the whole kalima la ilaha illallah uh, has been the call of every messenger from the beginning of the times till the end of the times. But after the coming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now these two are deeply intertwined. Now it has to be. Now you cannot just say La ilaha illallah. There is like a you need both. You need La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They go together. They go hand in hand. Right. And these two things, if we hold on to them tightly, then the Prophet Sallallahu told us, then you will not then you will not go astray and everything. And um, you know, one of the teachers, they they say that every year you should try to and, and for those who can, obviously it's not like uh, we all have our own commitments and everything or if not one year, then whatever. But you, we should always have some kind of study going on of the or whatever pace we can uh, of the Quran and through like this, this tafsir or that tafsir or this class or that class, but something's going on. And when one finishes, start the other of the Quran and the seerah. Right, so keep keep studying. Sira and the Quran should be a part of our life that we we don't let go of them ever. Like, uh, let's say we've joined this class and this class goes on, and once we um, take us to that point in our lives, but once we are able to let's say uh, reach the end of the Quran, then uh, once we finish with Surah Nas, we start again from Fatiha, and maybe we are going deeper or we are looking at diff another tafsir or or different other things, but we start again, and that's why even when we do the tilawat of the Quran. We don't stop when we reach like when we are reading the Quran, when we reciting the Quran, when we reach the end, we reach Surah uh, Nas and we fin uh, finish Surah Nas. We, we go right back to Fatiha. We don't close the Mus'haf and put it away. We go back to Fatiha, read a little bit from Raqqara and then uh, uh, then then uh, put, uh, finish our recitation for that sitting and go uh, away and then come back later for the next one. So we don't. So it's like a, a, our whole life we revolves around. Uh, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet we, and almost like if we think of we we think of the Tawaf that we do of the Kaaba, like we go round and round. It's like uh, one circle finishes, another starts, right? So we go round and round, and that that's um, we keep going around, no matter what part of the world we are in. We will we'll face the Kaaba and pray towards it. We, that is our center, right? So that is that is something that we need to hold on tightly to. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uses the word here Habal, right? Um, وَأَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ And Habl, the meaning of Habl is rope, right? Um, and what is a rope? A rope binds two things together, like one person has one end of it, the other person has the other end of it. And because of that rope, what happens is the people are connected, right? The, if two people are holding the two ends of a rope, there's a sense of relationship, there's a sense of contact in between them, right? And um, so related meanings of Habal from the rope come to also come to like that thing that becomes a means of taking um, make helping you to reach your goal. So something that you hold on to that you follow that you pull up with, pull up with that helps you to reach your goal. It is a means to reach your destination, right? And also um, the the muscle that joins our neck to our shoulders. The the word used for it in Arabic is Habal, right? So um, the it's from the same root. Ha, bind, uh, ha, ba, and la, right? So that same root. So the what does this muscle do? It joins us from the neck to the shoulders, and it's interesting that just like when if this this muscle or this this part is cut off, which is like the the uh, neck to the shoulders, that that area that is cut off, then a person dies. Similarly, um, if the hablila is cut off from a person's life then it's like a spiritual death of a person. Then it's like when you don't 
go to the Quran, when you don't go to when you when you start to when that starts to take a backseat in your life, then that's like a spiritual um, default uh, sp spiritual decay starts in a person then because that's that's something that's keeping us alive. That's the source of our life for us, of our spiritual life for us. It also comes the word Habal also comes in the meaning of Ahad, right? So Ain Ha in that Ahad is Ahad is a contract, a covenant between two people, right? And uh, like uh, to to do any job, we have there's a certain there's some like uh, price to it, right? Or that uh, so let's say two people are making a contract or something that okay, I'm going to sell you this car, let's say, and you're going to pay me this amount of money, and then this car is yours. And so there's a contract between the two of them that okay, you are going to give me this much money. And I'm going to give you the car. It's the two. Uh, it's both of them have a certain level of commitment, and both of them are bound to each other through this contract, right? That that is there, right? So, so what is a hubble? It's like a covenant. It's a contract between two people as well, two entities as well, right? So when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying wa tasimu billahi, uh, that means like hold on for dear life to the rope of Allah. Right, and uh, some scholars have uh, said it to mean that to hold on tightly to the rope of Allah, meaning anything. And what is the rope of Allah here? Meaning that anything that that joins you to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And what what could those things be? That those things could be the commands of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Those things could be your prayer. Those things could be your thankfulness, your gratitude towards Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Those things could be your obeying the commandments of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right to um, you know like so so anything uh, tr your truthfulness your honesty in doing things your uh, you know like you're not doing shirk with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala so all the, all the things anything that joins you to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is a habil is a rope and wa tasimu billah is like when you hold on so tightly to something that if you um, another meaning ingrained in this is that if something pulls you away from it then you feel the pain of it because you're so tightly attached to something you're so holding on to something with your dear life that if something tries to pull you away from it then you feel a pain of of that separation from it and then you you want to like just rush back to it right and so if there is anything let's say anything happens in our life that takes us a little bit away for, or that something's happening around us or something's happening in which we have we end up having to be uh, be at a gathering or be at a place or something where the commands of Allah are not being followed or something, then we feel that pain inside us. And if we feel that pain, then Alhamdulillah, that's a sign that um, you know we are we are going towards the rope of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That we are feeling this pain when something pulls us away from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? So that that um, so anything that will that will combine us, that will take us, that will join us to the commands of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, is um, Habal of Allah, like the rope of Allah. And the Mufassirin, the people who do the tafsir of the uh, Quran, they, they've also said, a lot of them have also agreed that this refers to the Quran itself, that Hablillah is the Quran itself. And why is that? Because Allah's book, this Quran, is what joins Allah's slave with Allah. right? And in the previous ayat, we learned that hold on tightly to Allah. And now we are learning hold on tightly to the rope of Allah. So and it is so beautiful because it's like um, they say that one part of the Quran gives a tafsir of the other part of the Quran. And that's why when we read the Quran, when we study the Quran again and again, when scholars who um, who devote their lives to the Quran and they studied like they studied, let's say for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, they went through the whole Quran, they studied it. And when they go back and start studying again, what happens is new things open up now. Why? Because they've studied the Quran and then this reminds them of that ayah and that that opens some other meanings and then they look at the other discussion and there's so much rich tradition, alhamdulillah, that we have that uh, and in almost every language we see that there is so much tradition that we have that we have all these like people who have pondered before us, people who have put down those thoughts that when we can look at it, we'll see there's so much connection, right? So. What does uh what what is this explaining that when Allah Taala earlier told that hold on to the hold on to Allah tightly and and a person might think and say okay but how do I hold on to Allah like yes uh, I mean as a concept yes I get it hold on to Allah tightly but what do I do to hold on to Allah I can't see Allah I can't uh, I can't uh, like that is a pleasure that has been um, preserved for the afterlife for people who Allah Subhanahu Taala will be pleased with but right now I'm in this life so right right now. What do I do to hold on to Allah? And then Allah Ta'ala explains it himself in this ayah uh, that holding on tightly to Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala means hold on tightly to the rope of Allah, meaning hold on tightly to this book of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. 
because Allah's book will join Allah's slaves with Allah. This is like a this Quran is like a covenant. It's an agreement to hold on to it is to hold on to Allah. So this Quran is a covenant between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a human beings. More than like a physical commitment, it's like more of a moral commitment that we will abide by the teachings of this book. Right. And uh, uh, because it is called the, the Mufassirings have said, Huwa Hablullah, like this Quran is the rope of Allah. And this is that rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, sent down to us from the skies. And there's a hadith to the effect of that Quran um, is like Allah's book is Allah's rope, which is stretched from the sky to the earth, right? And the and it is said to the effect that that one end of this rope is in Allah's hands and the other end is in our hand, right? And so hold on tightly, like let, literally like uh, tie yourself up with this rope so that you will be saved and this is the only way to save and we can imagine as if like there's a you know like and quran uses this imagery a lot uh, of drowning let's say somebody is drowning then what do they do like they, there's a rope and everything they'll hold on tightly and they'll pull themselves up with this rope because it's like you need to hold on tightly to it for dear life literally for dear life because if you don't hold on to this rope what will happen waves will literally push you here and there Waves will literally like water has so much force that if even if our hands are stretched out, we won't be able to even like even if we are the best weightlifters of the world, we won't be able to even bring our hands back in because it's like um, the it, the water has so much force. It just literally you cannot do anything. And when we look at, for example, the the videos or the talks of tsunamis and everything, it's like you're helpless in front of water. What can you do? Where can you go? What can there's nothing? Nobody can do anything. It's like uh, human beings literally see how powerless they are at that time. And so if you're drowning and then you have this one end, which is there towards a, a lifeguard or a ship or something has sent this uh, or something secure has sent this rope down, you need to hold on to it with dear life. Otherwise, you'll be tossed here and there, right? And um, so basically it is said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on upon his earth. He's in the heavens, above the heavens on his earth. And he has sent this Quran. He has sent this Quran down so that we as human beings, we learn how to live our life. We will learn how to live our life through this. And subhanAllah, this is also, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have told each one of us individually as well. But this is a big rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has made things happen in such a way that he sent a rope down. He sent this Quran down. He sent it, um, the Quran down and then everything. And he didn't tell everyone individually because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told me and you individually, right? And subhanAllah, Musa alayhi salam was the kalimullah, but uh, we are not that. And that also is a rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if we were, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving us a command directly and if we still disobeyed him, then it's like uh, what was left then? To prove right and um, so it's like it's a big rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he he sends this and he sends this to us in stages because he knows when we are ready for the next stage and then he he opens that for us because he knows how much we can handle at one time because Aisha anha, she said that if the command to leave alcohol had come um, in the very beginning uh, of the the first if it, that was the first ayah to come that okay leave alcohol then none of us would have left it. And she was talking about the Sahabas, the best of generations that that we would not have. But it came gradually. First, it came like don't even go near the don't go near the prayer when you are when you are intoxicated. So what happened in a society where alcohol was like water? People had uh, uh, alcohol all the time, right? What happened was that okay, you cannot go now. You're a Muslim. You cannot go to the prayer near uh, you can't go near the prayer when you're intoxicated. What did that mean that you can't drink during the day? Because during the day, all the prayers are coming one after the other soon, because if you're if you get drunk in the morning, then Zuhar time after Fajr, you drink any time. OK, Zuhar time will come and then you'll still be intoxicated. You cannot pray then then you'll miss your prayer. So you can't pray that time. You can't um, uh, so, sorry, you can't drink that time. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to pray. And then you can't drink between Zuhar and Asr and for same reasons and or for Asr between Asr and Maghrib and between Maghrib and Isha at the same reason. So then their their drinking kind of became limited to after Isha, right? And that too, not very late because so they had a limited time where when they could to follow this commandment. So they're so they were slight they were weaned off step by step because it's like when somebody's addicted to something 
whether it is watching something on their phones or um, or, or watching something all the time on, on, on you know, like um, social media or television or movies or this and that, or whether somebody is addicted to um, alcohol or some food or something. Whenever anybody is addicted to something, it takes stages for them to leave it. It's not uh, if somebody asks them to just leave it, it's not going to work because addictions, that's how addictions work. And addiction could be anything. And we know now that, uh, for example, um, social media today, we know that the people who were hired for the social media uh, today, the the first people that were hired for um, and the people nowadays were hired for like Facebook and Twitter and all these things and the same the, in the at the first time the people who were hired were the people who are at the casinos uh, of um, you know like uh, uh, la and everything they they used to run the casinos because they are experts in addictive behavior and they know how to promote addictive behavior and uh, those people were hired to do this that okay how can you make people addicted to social media how can you make what can we do to make people addicted to it that they won't be able to they will spend hours upon hours upon their phones or they're doing this scrolling watching things and they won't be able to get off it because it's like they'll be so addicted to it. But uh, how do we get that them to get addicted? But what Quran also does for us is it helps us in de-addiction as well. And um, we, we learn different things again when we uh, when we go through the Quran and the Sunnah, right? And uh, there's a hikmah in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, uh, how he sends his commands to us. And there's a lot of rahmah in how he has sent his commands to us and how we follow them, right? So here, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this rope, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this Quran, then the, in the way it was sent, then it it became a necessity in, for all these things to be written down, uh, for them to be memorized and everything, so that they could be conveyed to the next generation and other people, let's say, who were not around um, Medina at that time. So how do you get this across now? You've got this Quran now, and now the uh, people of uh, the Quran, the Muslims, they have this uh, goal to spread this Quran and everything. So what are you going to do? You have to think now. OK, how do I get this Quran to other people? Right, so you're going to have to what, write down things. You're going to have to memorize. They're going to have people who are going to do the hifs of the Quran. They're going to be uh, circles of people who are going to study the Quran and then those learn from those circles and spread that ahead and take it ahead and everything. Right, so that is going to happen as well and everything. And then so in this effort, people will have to come together and do this and they will hold uh, they will have to hold on tightly to it. Right, so there's a hikmah that is there. Um, uh, in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even sent down this Quran and preserved this Quran and uh, made this Quran reach us as well. And he didn't give us his commands individually. Otherwise, we would be we would not be able to uh, stand up for it. Right. Allah knows all of our weakness. He created us. He knows everything. Right. And um, in every time, in every time, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do in every generation? He's he sent things. Uh, he sent his message to the human beings through the way of Wahi and everything, and um, this is the how the message has reached to us. And if we look at this whole rope and this whole journey, one side of this is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and then there is this message in between. And at the other end, uh, and if we there's a whole chain going, like how did the Quran reach me and you? It's not just me and you. And then this rope, in in this rope is the generations before us who worked hard to preserve the Quran, who went through hardships to preserve this Quran, who were who, who went through torture. People people troubled them, people tortured them. They went through oppression just to preserve the Quran. They would not let go of this deen. And because they did not let go of this deen, that's how this deen got to us. There are some people in the generation, even if we see vast majority of people who are away from the deen, we will see that in every generation there have been some people who took upon themselves, I will not let go of this, right? And they held, held on tightly to this and they became the means of this going forward. And so if you look at that, we have people between us and the Prophet there are many generations of people who have, and in each generation there have been people who have hold, held on tightly to this Quran. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those people in our generation too. And make, may Allah Ta'ala make from our coming generations those people too, who hold on tightly to the Quran. And then going back to the Prophet Sallallahu And from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam, because he brought the wahi of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to the Prophet Sallallahu And then going back to uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala himself. 
So if you look at it, it's a whole chain. It's a whole it's a it's a rope that's tying and it's like you cannot just go there like the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be through this rope. We, we cannot like just make our own ways of OK, you know what? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told five prayers. I'm going to do I'm I'm going to be a like a bigger moment. I'm going to be like uh, someone who's like even more committed. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do pray Fajr instead of four rakat. I'm going to pray like eight rakat in Fajr. I'm going to pray like uh, instead of four rakat for uh, Zuhar, uh, I'm going to pray um, 16 rakat uh, in that and everything. Not the Sunnahs and the Nafir, but I'll, I'll increase the Fajr. Uh, first, you, you cannot do that. This is a way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this road. We have to go through what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi taught us, and that's how we reach Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We cannot, we cannot make our own interpretations of the Quran. Right? We have to go through the the journey. Like uh, it is said, one of uh, our teachers they say that this Deen has come to us through Nakal, right? Nakal, not through a cut. What what does that mean? Not through our own intelligence. And we learned that even in the beginning of the Surah Baqarah itself, Alif Lam Mim, Allah Taala told us, uh, taught us intellectual humility right from the get go that OK, when you come to this Quran, you have to be humble and the dictionary of this Quran is not going to be just the Arabic language. You cannot just learn the Arabic language and then learn the Quran. No, that's never going to be enough to learn the Quran. You'll have to go through the seerah of the Prophet. You have to go through what did the previous generations talked about it? The previous generations of scholars talked about it. What did the and most importantly, what did the Prophet say about these these ayat? How was this ayat lived? by the first generation, by the people who the Prophet ﷺ taught himself and everything. And that's how you learn. Yes, Arabic language is going to play a major role uh, and we have to learn Arabic eventually if we want to dive deeper, but that's just one step. That's not all of it. There's going to be much more to be able to understand the Quran correctly. If you just look at the Arabic language and try to just go through the translations and then just come up with our own meanings, then then we, we, we can get um, we can get misleaded very quickly and there are many people who are doing that. May Allah protect us and forgive us for that. Right, so we have to go through Hadith. We have to go through the seed of the Prophet. So that's the, the whole rope. We cannot just let go of all of it. Right, and uh, so in the middle is all of this. So what is so what is Hablillah? If we look at all of that, Hablillah is that we look at what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the ways of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and through the Sharia that has come to us through what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down of this Quran and, and the Hadith and everything, right? So, uh, so whatever has reached us through this Quran and through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of Allah's pleasure and then we follow that, we hold on tightly to that, that is Hablillah. Right. And another thing is that we learned like like we talked last time that another thing that we learned very similar in Surah Al-Baqarah was um, right? Like after Surah, uh, after telling us about who Allah subhanahu wa is an idol kursi, he tells us that who, uh, that the one who rejects the Tawhut and um, prays to Allah subhanahu wa alone and holds on tightly to Urbat al then that person saved, right? He told us that and then uh, so Again, there is an imagery going on here. So if it is something that uh, that is a uh, that is a strong chain, strong like uh, hold that we are holding, like a, that's a strong ring that we are holding on, uh, which is uh, attached to a rope, and then we're trying to get up, get out of, let's say, the sea, something that's drowning us and everything. What will happen is as we keep holding on to this rope and keep climbing, it's going to pull us up. First of all, right, we're going to go higher and higher up and one thing to understand is as we climb the rope, right? We might have been first. We might have been in the water. Things were just like things would just every way would just slap us in this direction. This way will come us and throw us in that direction. That will will come throw us in that direction. We were at like at mercy of our society or or at the mercy of what's going on. And everything was just like throwing us off here and there. And we'll go. We are just literally traveling according to tides of the time, right? And we were just at the mercy of the tides of the time. And now we have hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this uh, rope and we held on tightly to it. And now as we climbing uh, or through this rope, we're, we're holding on to this rope and we're, we started to climb on this rope. What happens is as you go higher, then your perspective changes. What we are seeing now when we were in the tides, we didn't see that as any we were in any trouble or anything. But now as we are climbing up, we are seeing that, OK, the people I was in that position before 
and other people in that position. But Allah SWT is bringing, I need to pull them out too because like they, I can see the danger they are in. They are not seeing the danger. They think they're enjoying themselves, but they're drowning. They don't even realize that they're drowning. But, um, but your perspective changes. But the thing is, one thing to understand is, although you, you might be seeing things from another perspective now, other people are not seeing that perspective. So again, one thing in communications they say is we have to understand the perspective of our audience to be able to connect to them, right? Not that we agree with their perspective necessarily, but we have to understand their perspective so that we can talk to them in terms that they can understand that will work for them, right? Because if we talk to them in our terms or everything, then it won't work. Also, another thing is, that if we keep getting frustrated when people don't, if we, let's say, I'm speaking the truth, I'm speaking about prayer, I'm speaking about this, and another person's just not getting it. They're not like, okay, why do I need to do that? I don't get it. This doesn't make any sense to me or anything at all. And, and we keep getting frustrated. You know, you have to worship Allah alone. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. And why are you not doing this? And why are you not doing that? Uh, and we are getting frustrated and frustrated and frustrated. What we are not realizing is that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to be able to see now the other person is not seeing at all and what is important is for them to see it first to be able to follow it because they don't see it yet so um so the difference in perspective the, and, and again it's not in our control whether they see it or not that's to totally a blessing of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes we can try and we will keep trying we, ne we never lose hope we always keep trying but one thing is that frustration um just because somebody else is not seeing the perspective that we are seeing and we know this to be the truth that frustration needs to go because if that frustration is there that will block us and shaitan would prey on that frustration to to block us and to um uh, to not be able to do anything another thing is when let's say somebody uh, was on the ground floor and they hold on to this they held on to this rope and they're trying to climb up now they're climbing let's say rock climbing or something they're climbing up and they they got up to like one feet or something and then um, something happened. They let go of it. They fell down. It'll just be like a small jump. Let's say they instead of one feet, they they went up to 10 feet and then uh, something happened. They let go. OK, it will be a bit of a jump, but, but Alhamdulillah, they'll be OK. They won't get hurt or anything. They'll be fine. But let's say somebody has climbed like 50 feet, 100 feet, 1000 feet, 10,000 feet. Now, when they are that high, if something happens, and they let go of this, what happens is they are not going to survive, right? So what's what also it tells us is that the higher up we go in our deen, the more what happens is sometimes when we get like a bit, um, let's say somebody's we are praying regularly, we are doing some things regularly, we are doing um, sadaqa regularly, we are praying over salah, we are uh, we are doing all of, we are reciting our Quran, we are learning the Quran, we are teaching the Quran. Let's say we're doing all these things and everything. And then some people look up and say, you know what, Alhamdulillah, you're so good. I wish I was like that. And like, you know, you're doing so good and your heart is so much like this and I wish I were like you and everything. And Alhamdulillah, a lot of people mean it from a good place as well. So it's like we're not even talking about people who are being nasty or something like let's say people are being some people are really looking up to us and let's say commenting on us and everything. Now what might happen is, you know, you can take it a bit lightly because like, OK, you don't have to be so hard on yourself. Like, come on, you're so like good and everything, right? Like you're like, OK, I wish I was like we are like nothing. Like I don't do half of the things that you're doing, so you can you can easily like relax a little bit. Now what happens to a person if a person is like really, really high up on the rope and he's like on a very high, he, let's say he's reached certain height. Uh, of through he's climbed up a little bit more now when if somebody says that and they're like yeah i can take off one hand and pat myself on the back with that yeah i'm okay i can actually leave my hand and everything what happens is the danger became becomes much more because they are higher up so so the more actually with this deen the more we go the more we are following the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more we allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening up the doors for us the more we are learning about the deen of allah the more we are following the deen of allah the stronger Actually, we have to hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this strength needs to actually increase because if we fall from that height now, that's going to be catastrophic, right? That's not, we, we're going to be done. There's going to be nothing left. What happened to Iblis? Iblis was so high up, he was praying with the angels, right? But when Iblis fell, just one, he refused one sajda and that's it. 
he was done. He, there was nothing left then. Why? Because he had reached a certain position and the fall from there, he's done, right? So he he's he's talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him this command directly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told uh, the angels that he's going to create. And he uh, obviously he would have heard this conversation himself as well. And then he refused, right? So the, that one. And uh, subhanAllah for us, even though as human beings, so many of us, may Allah ta'ala forgive all, all of our mistakes and may Allah ta'ala make us firm. But we miss so many salah and yet like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep, oh, that keeps the door open for us until our last breath. Okay, come back to Tawbah. Do to Tawbah. Even if you've, you've missed every single prayer of your life, you just used to pray every Jummah or let's say you just used to pray every Eid. It's okay. You can come back. You can come back. You can come back. Why do we have these chances still? We have not seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And it is a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has kept himself in ghaib for us. That he has uh, He has left this door open for us to come back to him. Right? Because that door is open. But at the same time, when we are climbing, the rope of Allah, every step we take towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time we climb up a little bit more, we have to hold on even tighter. Not get frustrated by other people who are not holding on as tightly maybe, or who are not uh, seeing the perspective that we are seeing, right? And uh, to understand that what we are seeing is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Maybe that other blessing has not reached them, but it is a blessing of Allah that reaches. First, we have to be thankful about it, and then we have to hold on even tighter, right? And... Um, so uh, we, we can think of that like if we if we um you know if we want to uh, go higher and higher and higher we need to climb up right so it's like uh, we want it's 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 a desire within us if we think about it like no matter what field we are in no matter um what we want to do whether it's at home or whether it's in a professional field or anything we want to go higher it's a desire between all of us we want to climb up and everything right so it's it's another fitra that we want to go higher and we want to go on um on heights of different things right so it's like uh it's another fitra that we want to go in the in the skies we want to travel and Allah has put it there for us right and so even for Adam alayhi salam when he was sent down he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he wanted to go back because obviously he was in Jannah before and now he's sent down to this earth he doesn't know if you think about Adam alayhi salam and Hawa radiallahu anha and how their first um a few days on this earth would have been like it would have been like they were in Jannah. They don't have to cook. They don't have to clean. They don't have to earn. They don't have to hunt. They don't have to do anything. They don't have any physical pains. They don't have any uh, any, any kinds of pains at all. They don't they don't have this like mutual friction and like between man and woman. Uh, they don't have this like arguments between each other. They don't have everything so peaceful. They just get each other like this. They don't they're not like, oh, my God, they're not like men are like, oh, my God, I don't get women and women are like I just don't get men. Right. It, it but that problem was not there in Jannah, right? So all of these things, if you look at it, this this dunya was so different and they were used to Jannah. They had lived in Jannah before. So when they were sent down, they asked Allah Subhanahu they wanted to go back. But then now it's not possible to go back like that. Now the way to Jannah has changed, right? And what has happened now, once we came back to this earth, now human beings, uh, Adam alayhi salam and by extension, all of us now, all Bani Adam, all for all human beings now when the the way to jannah yes we are still meant for jannah we want to climb up we want to go there but the way to this jannah is now that now we'll have to live in this world right we live in this world and through the prophets allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep sending us his sharia his messages right and then when they reach us when these messages reach us and then if we hold on tightly to this right and uh, then there will be no no fear upon us and then no sadness uh, will stay upon us and then we'll be able to climb up right so the thing is we have to hold on tight to if even if we let go of if we want to lose our fears and our anxieties then uh, and we know in psychology these are the two sadness and fear right these are the two main main emotions or they're the two main categories into which every other mental disorder falls into as well either there is sadness or there is anxiety some fear something is there right so and allah subhanahu wa says again and again in the quran la alayhim wa la hum yahsanun. if you do this there'll be no khawf and no no sadness if you do that no khawf and no sadness like allah subhanahu wa is telling us through the quran that okay this is the uh this is the rope of allah hold on tightly to it 
And as you climb up, keep climbing up, hold on tightly and tightly and tightly, even more tightly. And um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us that he will, and we learned that in Surah Bakr in the beginning that Allah said, I will send my guidance and my guidance comes to you. Whoever follows it will be saved, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us this rope through the heavens. And um, so this is the promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the mankind that he will send hidayah. He will send hidayah and he keeps sending hidayah and he lets this, uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said to the effect of that this deen will reach every house on this planet. It will reach every pakka house and every kacha house. It will reach every mud house and it, it will reach every palace. This deen will reach every corner of this earth. It will reach and it is uh, the message will reach everywhere. Now, once somebody gets the message, now it will be upon them how they react to the message. Are they going to hold on or are they going to ignore it? Right, that that will be that person's thing, but the message will reach them. The message will reach every person, and um, we will live until we um, the message has somehow reached us. Even if other people don't know, the message would have reached us, and Allah Taala would have given us that opportunity to accept and to hold on to that message, right? Because that is the promise of Allah, uh, and we will be accountable only for whatever message has reached us, right? So. Um, that will be there. And if we look at, for example, there's a res there's a rescue team trying to save a lot of. And again, like I said, there's a lot of imagery uh, that will help us understand this these concepts in the science. So let's say there is a lot of people in the water. A lot of people are drowning. A lot of people are there in the water and there's a rescue team who's trying to save a lot of people. Right. So what they do is they have a straight rope and they put it in the water. What will happen is like if we imagine there's this straight rope there, there's only a certain number of people who can hold on to this rope and they can be saved because there's only so many people who can hold on to this rope because other people will not be able to get to it. Now the smart thing, the intelligent thing to do could be at the end of this rope, you make a huge ring and you attach that ring to it. And what will happen with this ring is there are much more many people, more people now who can have access to this ring, who can hold on to this ring. And the bigger the ring, the more people can hold on and go up and the more people can be saved and it will be easier for everyone because there'll be enough space, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when he's saying, uh, all of you together, right? First of all, uh, it means that hold on. To, first of all, let, let's look at the other meaning that the rope, let's say it's the rope, all of it, meaning hold on to all of the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hold on to all of the uh, all of the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this this deen is not a buffet that you can pick and choose it's like okay i will i will go and i'll do this thing i like okay this is uh, it's convenient for me to do this uh, let's say i'll go for jumma salah but you know don't ask me to leave interest based transactions okay i'll leave interest based transactions but don't ask me to leave alcohol or come on like gambling like at least i can buy a lottery ticket like what's the big deal in lottery ticket i'm not harming anybody i'm sitting at home i'm buying a ticket what if I, people win 70 million dollars in this what if i'm in, in that you know i will give so much charity out of it i'll be no, 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 no. We can't do that. We cannot pick and choose and we cannot like counter something just because we cannot do to do something good. We can to do something halal. We cannot choose a haram route. Like let's say somebody earns haram money. Then even if they buy zabiha halal by hand meat, that is still haram. Right. So I, I remember one time there was a lady who was um, uh, they, they ran a shop. They were uh, running a shop of like uh, abayas and things and everything. And they had these like halal nail polishes. And now that's another debate whether they are totally halal or not. But they said basically that's what they say that they, this is a voodoo friendly uh, halal nail polish and everything. And they're like, OK, these are halal nail polishes and they were a rage at one time. And then what she was saying is like they were she's like, you won't believe what what happened. There were some so uh, there were some people, some ladies who would come and everything, and there are people and they had to put those in a in a closed case. Why? Because there were people who were coming and stealing those halal nail polishes. And then she was like, you know what, though, it just boggles my mind. Do like people don't do people not use their minds? OK, th this is well, uh, this is like a voodoo friendly halal nail polish. But if you steal it, it's no longer halal. Even if it is like a voodoo friendly nail polish, it is still not halal for you because you've stolen it. How can you steal a halal nail polish and call it halal for you? Like it's it's not halal for you anymore, right? So it's like uh, you cannot pick and choose that. OK, I'm buying this. I'm, I'm getting this halal somehow. So this is halal for me. No, it is like we 
this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a kamil, it's a complete deen. We have to follow all of it. And yes, we might have weaknesses that, okay, yeah, I'm following these commandments and like I'm, I'm trying every day with this one and yeah, Allah help me and I'm weak and everything, but I'm trying and please forgive me. That's one thing. That's a, that, that that's Alhamdulillah. That's okay. But to say that, you know what, this doesn't apply. Okay. I, I follow these three things. Come on, this fourth one. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Allah understands. Allah is Ghufur Rahim. You know what? Like it's, it's okay. You know, like I have college. I can't do this. I have work. You know, like my work starts in the morning, like Fajr. I'll just pray when I come back. That does not work like that, right? So we have to hold on to all of it. Another thing here that Allah is teaching us is uh, hold on firmly to the rope of Allah all together, meaning all of you Muslims together, hold on tightly to it. And what that will do is Muslims, not only individually, but also collectively, all of you hold on to the Quran. This book should enjoy a central position in the Ummah. And they should, all the Muslims, you should establish a deep attachment to it because this and this alone, when you have, you'll form a deep attachment to the Quran, this book will become a uniting bond between them. It will hold you together, right? And uh, we know that even a small deviation or misunderstanding can lead to horrific consequences when when anything happens in any relationship, even example, right? So it can lead to a lot of lot of harm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, he has made this Sharia wide and strong enough that it can hold all of mankind. Like we we are imagining that ring at the end of it to, who's trying to save um, all the people. There's a rescue team who's saving a lot of people from the water and there's this very strong rope, the strongest rope that ever is, and that has a huge ring at the end of it. Now this rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has a huge ring at the end of it, it is wide enough and is strong enough. The Sharia of Allah is wide and strong enough to hold the whole, do, to hold the whole of mankind and there's enough space still. It's like, it's not tight. It's not constricted. It's it's spacious. Like Rabbi Shahli Sadri. Like it's there's this wasa. There's like space in it. Like when we come to this theme, a lot of times when we are when uh, a lot of people who are not from uh, born in Muslim families and when they come to this theme, it's like you can feel like a uh, relief. Like I'm I'm finally home. It's it's you get this feeling that I was like being. Uh, being like uh, pushed here and there and there and there and people would say anything and everything but now I finally found myself I found uh, belonging right so what what this this sharia is strong enough wide enough and everybody who comes to it will find that space for themselves it's not like only an Arab person could be a Muslim, only a white person could be a Muslim, or a black person could be a Muslim, or a girl could be a Muslim, or a boy could be a Muslim, or a young could be a Muslim, or an old could be a Muslim, or a person from 1400 years ago could be a Muslim, or a person from uh, 2023 could not be a Muslim, or a person from 3025 will not be a Muslim. All generations, all people, all color, all creed, all nationalities, this deen ha is wide and strong enough for everyone, for the whole of mankind, right? And when we come together, also there's there's a lot of there's a lot of community involved in our deen. That's why we call the Muslim Ummah, right? We are the uh, we, we are the children of Adam alayhi salam. We are upon the millet of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and we are from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, right? And there is a concept of community interwoven in our religion. You cannot escape it. We have to go for Hajj to Mecca and Medina when it is the Hajj season, when there will be a million people there and we'll have to learn sabr. When there'll be so many people, there will be logistical issues there. When you go there, there'll be some buses will be delayed. Everything will be moving slowly. There'll be shortage of food and water. There'll be you'll have to share the limited water you have. You'll have you'll have to only two bottles of water that you're saving up because like you're not drinking all day. You're like, OK, OK, I know I, I'll be thirsty. I'm, I'm saving up. I'm saving up. And then you'll see somebody in front of you who will be super thirsty while you are thirsty as well. And you're like, do I drink it? Do I give it? Do I drink it? Do I give it? Do I drink half the bottle and give half the bottle to them? Or do I give them all the water and do I stay thirsty? What do I do? You'll have this these mental dilemmas because you'll you'll go through this like you'll you'll be pushed into it. You'll be pushed into those situations while you might not be living those situations in your day to day life. You're not be going through those kind of shortages. Our fridges might be full. We have water as soon as we open our taps, what cold water, hot water. We have all these situations, but but we will be pushed into that being together with community and all kinds of people. Some people will be really nice that we encounter. Some people will be really rude and we'll still have to be nice to them because we have come here for our own uh, spiritual connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm responsible for my behavior. I have to still be respectful even though the other person is not being that respectful, right? So 
And so we'll be pushed into that. We, we, there is congregational prayers. People have to go. Men have to go for Jummah, right? When they go for Jummah, they have to stand. So when people of different communities, especially smaller communities, when they have to go together to pray their congregational prayer, a person who's super rich will have to pray sometimes next to the person who's a janitor, maybe. And he, they have to stand. They cannot leave space between their shoulders. They have to stand shoulder to shoulder and they will have to face this that, yes, we are equal human beings. I cannot dis treat this person like trash. This person is is my Muslim brother or my Muslim sister. I cannot do that, right? So the whole concept of community will have to give zakat to Muslim people only. What that happens is we'll have to look for Muslim people. There'll be a struggle involved to go and look for people who are Muslim people who are in need because then I cannot just can I not just give it to anybody who's in need because then I don't have to go ahead and look for it, right? When I go ahead and look for other Muslim brothers or sisters in need, and then when I keep looking and keep looking and I find some of the people, then I realize, no, a lot of people in my ummah have needs that I don't know of. And then I come to know of new needs and everything. And then I was like, no, Alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. it humbles us. It brings us back to, and it keeps us getting, it, it brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this sense of community, this sense of, holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala develops us individually also, but there is a collective flavor to this theme that cannot be like all of us will be praying towards one Kaaba. Every single prayer, every single moment in this world, somewhere somebody is praying towards the Kaaba. Somebody is uh, praying at some point in this world right now, and every second somebody is praying towards the Kaaba somewhere in the world, right? Uh, some namaz they are praying, right? So we are joined in that. We are all joined in that and everything. And also through uh, also this also brings us to the fact that we have to find and when we don't find, we have to create circles of holding on together to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning circles of studying the Quran. Even if we don't find, let's say if I don't find any uh, any circle of uh, something that's happening around me or something, I have to I have to look for something. Okay, what can I do in my community, in my group of people? How can I bring them closer to the Quran? What can I do? How can I share with them, even if it is just one ayah? What can I do? So I have to I have to think of that. I have to think of ways. And when I can't find any, and I keep, uh, you know, like um, one thing some of our teachers say is, when you want to be useful in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't just like, you don't just get chosen to do something. First, you have to rub your nose in sajda a lot and ask Allah and beg Allah, Ya Allah, make me useful in your way. Make me useful in your way. Make me useful in your way. And when you keep doing it, keep, it, this is something so precious that you keep doing that and then Allah will give it to you. Right. So it's like, yes, Allah can give Allah gives food to everybody, whether it's a believer or a kafir, whether it's a disbeliever, a hypocrite, Allah gives food and money and wealth to anybody because these are these are not super precious things. What is super precious is Hidayat. What is so, so hidayat? We have to ask for it. That's why we ask for it in every salah, in every rakat of every salah. We ask, Iyaka na abudu wa iyaka na stain. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Allah guide me to the straight path, right? And throughout our life, we keep asking that. We keep asking that, and especially to be of benefit in the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, we have to beg Him, and we have to beg Him, and we have to beg Him, and He'll make us useful in His path. And and so when we have to look for the circles to study the Quran, to teach the Quran, and we have to form um, form the circles when there are none to start um, uh, contemplating, to start studying the Quran together. And coming together will have a benefit of in more intellectual humility, because sometimes when we are study groups and we are we share some idea and everything. And then if I put, you know what, it makes me think like this and we share our ideas. And then the other person said, yes, it's a good point, but you know what? This actually means da 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 da. So this is not like uh, yeah, your, your thinking is good, but it actually this I is not saying that this I is actually saying this. So what happens is it, it there's a lot of humility that we're like, oh, OK, so we learn to not my opinion is not everything. And that's the fifth enough today. If you look at today, it's like, uh, if people don't agree with each other, they feel that, OK, if you don't agree with me, that means you hate me. That means I have to be your enemy. That means, oh, she disagreed with me. Oh, my God, that means like, oh, she doesn't like me at all and everything and this and that. But if you look at our tradition of intellectual studies and everything, people coming together despite their differences, different people from different at different levels of taqwa, at different levels of ilm, at different levels of things coming together and this is how this the Sharia is that we come together. All of us, every person is distinct. We have different heights, different weight, different strength um, and everything. And um, 
in the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa It's not like whatever I said is right and whatever I understood is right, right? And only I'm going to go to Jannah because like obviously I'm like, it I'm like the Prophet Astaghfirullah like so that that's narrow mindedness and that's like it's not like I can go on saying you know what you you're wrong about this no you're you're wrong about this you're wrong about that and then this person Jahannam this person Jahannam this person Jahannam and it's like oh I will tell you what the right thing is the right thing is this 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 and we'll come across some people and they will look like sometimes scholars too that who will say and that's why uh, may Allah forgive may Allah, may Allah forgive may Allah forgive any any time um, like if and, and that's just a personal thing when when somebody is criticizing another person my name or something and that you know this person uh he's deviant because of this 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 person is deviant anytime a person is teaching or saying something like this i'm like okay i'm not going to listen to this person why because it's like they it's not the ideas right so there's a debate on ideas which is okay but debate on people putting people down that shows something that shows a narrow mindedness, which is not a part of our deen at all. Like our, our job as a Muslim Ummah is to gather as many people as possible and to help each other to go to Jannah together. That's Islam, right? Our job is not to declare others as kafir because of this, because what you do one small mistake, kafir. You know that you could have done hundred good things, one wrong thing, one slip. This is a kafir. This person is like this. This person supports this. This person is this and everything. Yes, we are all human. Mistakes happen, right? But but we don't divide ourselves in Farqan. Allah Ta'ala reinforces that by saying, Wala tafarraku, and do not be divided. That will be the reason of your downfall. If you start getting divided, that will be a reason of your um down for right don't get yourself out of this mentality of my group and this group and that group right and uh, if we imagine the rope again that allah could subhanahu ta'ala could have dropped thousands of ropes and each person or group of people could have caught their own and go go up it was possible but one rope hablila it's not a plural it's not the ropes of allah subhanahu ta'ala it's one rope one means we have to come together. We have to observe patient, patience. We have to make room for each other. We have to make a ring intelligently. Like so, um, like, like if you imagine there's a there's a food that is going to be served. There's a huge round plate in the middle of the room, and then it's filled with food and everything. Then everybody gets has to eat from that plate. Now we'll have to sit together. We'll have to talk to each other. We'll have to figure out. Okay, somebody needs something at that end of the plate. The chickens on that side and the um, vegetables are on this side and the bread is on this side. Now one person who's sitting there, they'll have to talk to another person to pass them the bread or the pass them this and everything. It's not like 20 plates for 20 people and everyone has their own. But what happens when everyone has their own plates in different gatherings that we see and they're all already made up? Sometimes someone is still hungry because their appetite is a bit more and everything. And some other people are wasting food because their their appetite is not too much. They were full or they don't like some things. They like some things, right? And this can still come and work, work somehow in the worldly things, but this does not work in the deen. In the deen, there's, there's, there's one big thing, right? There's one source. So we have to go back to the source. And yes, there are um, there, there are uh, differences sometimes and everything, but there's no divisions, right? There's a difference between difference and division, right? So there's no division in the, it does not work like that. Like the source is one and only. The source is the Quran and the Sunnah and everything streams from there, right? Any other way that, um, um, you know, like, um, so if you think of this, that another way to attach ourselves to this ring, let's say, is to attach Let's say there's this huge rope and there's this huge ring and now there's a lot and lot of people. What we can do is to this ring now, this huge ring now, we can attach small ropes and at the end of this small rope, we have other rings, right? Which are smaller rings, but there are other rings and then people could hold on to them and then this can go on and on. And if we can imagine, let's say the circulatory system of the body, right? There is a, there is a circulatory system and there's the whole, um, there's a whole like network of arteries and veins in the body, but end of the day, there's no separation. All stay connected to the main source, which is the heart, right? And if you think of the lungs, right? They all they all stay connected. There's there's like uh, this whole divisions like this, uh, uh, but but they're all connected to one main windpipe, right? This is there's a connection which is there through this, through this, through this, but the connections always 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 there. Any any artery or vein in the body, like it, it has to be connected to the heart somehow. 
right? And obviously it's, some can't go directly to the heart, but there's a journey there involved, right? If, if something cuts off from the heart, then that gets cut off, like the blood supply gets cut off, right? So we have to be connected, right? And uh, to live for ourselves only is narrow mindedness, right? Um, so to um, and narrow mindedness, what will that do is it will not let people benefit from this uh, this rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then such people, what we'll see is their their tongues will 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 give out poison sometimes for others, right? And they won't they, they will keep talking against each other like this one, that this one, that. And if you think about this in any house, when two brothers, when they fight with each other, what happens? Both of them actually their 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 respect goes down, not just one of them. Right. Both of them lose their honor when they're doing that. So differences and divisions, they creep up when despite uh, in the Muslim Ummah, when despite the deep love and respect for this book of Allah, for the Quran, the attachment to it is weakened. When the attachment to the Quran is weakened and the central position of our life, which was its appointed center for the Quran, instead of the Quran, when give it to we give it to mortal people or some scholar or their books or some uh, uh, some circles or our local imam or something. And, you know, like some spiritual attachments are formed and followers hold on to this rope of their own, like the Sufis or Buzurg or Alama or Imam or somebody like they, they have their own thing. But then those become the focus as opposed to the Quran. And what happens then is then people don't even feel the slipping away of the divine rope from their hands, the Quran from their hands. Right. And it's like it's so scary that they don't even feel that. And the sad result of this is sectarianism in Muslims, like one group fighting against the other group. And we can see that a lot today. Excuse me. So what do we have to do then? Right. This Sharia, right, when we when we hold on to this and we take people with us with love, not with not with frustration, not with anger, not with anything. Maybe take them with us with love and understand their perspective and everything. They might not be at the same level of taqwa for us, and that's OK. Inshallah, we keep praying and Allah Ta'ala will open that inshallah. But our job is to have sabr and everything and keep going on. Even Quran, it came at a time when Medina had been broken. Medina was broken before in Aus and Khazraj. They were fighting. They had the Battle of Buat between them for more than 100 years, 120 to 140 years, they say, before Islam they had. They were fighting. They were killing each other's people, right? And then they were Quraysh from Makkah. There were so many divisions in between them. The whole Arabia, there was a mutual enmity in Arabia as a result of which like one tribe was always at war with the other and everything. And there was they would they would break out into war on like littlest of things like egos were at the all time high. They would like anything small and it will lead to a war, right? You know, like um, uh, literally like uh, jealousy, pride, ego, unrestrained emotions. There were not no law and order. Anybody would loot anybody who has no protection and everything. And one war would start and then it'd be like, OK, he killed one of ours. We'll kill two of theirs. They kill two of theirs. I'll kill four of theirs, you know, like and then obviously that would go on and on and on and on. Right. And nobody's wealth and life was safe un uh, until they had some protection or something which was by somebody who's very um, strong or anything right so they had a lot of enmity amongst them right so remember Allah, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa when you were enemies to each other and the whole of Arabia was like that and what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do right they used to run from each other they used to fight with each other they used to have enmity they had to do they used to have hatred for each other deep 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 generational hatred for each other yet what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do he put ulfat between them for Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put love, um, habbat, care, softness between them, right? And one thing we have to realize that and we have to appreciate and respect about our religion is that this religion and that's the 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 way that Allah Ta'ala phrases it, we'll have it kind of uh, reminds us of that what kuru alaykum. Remember, this is the blessing of Allah. You did not create this love. And if somebody, if we see love between two people, it's not that they created this love or they're doing something special that I'm not doing uh, because they have that love. No, Allah Ta'ala is blesses people with the love. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is, is the one who controls the heart. So 
appreciate and respect this religion which has created in you these feelings of extreme love and integration and brotherhood between each other because of this Quran that love has come between this softness has come in in your hearts for each other this love that you feel for your brother or your sister and your deen uh, through this Quran and everything this this relationship even if you look at that generation Islam became a relationship bigger than blood like people were fighting against their own family members like they 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 were at war with their own family members. A father, uh, Abu Bakr, who he was at one side and his son was at the other side. After the battle, the son told the father later on, uh, many years later, after he became a Muslim, that, uh, oh, my father, he said to Abu Bakr, oh, my father, you know what? You came so many times near me. I saw you in the Battle of Badr when I was at the other side of the Quraysh. You came here, but you know, because you're my father, I didn't take the strike and I went away because like, so he was basically trying to show that I love you my, uh, so much, Dad. And like, you know what? I did this and everything. But what did Abu Bakr say? Abu Bakr say, you know what? If I had, be, if you had come in front of me, I would have taken the strike because I was fighting for the path of Allah, and you were fighting for against Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So it's like that relationship uh, was weaker. Uh, that relationship of blood even was weaker when it compared to the relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The, um, the history of mankind had never seen such kind of brotherhood before as we see uh, if we go over more of the the sira we will see the kind of love the sahabas had for each other the kind of devotion and love the sahabas had for the prophet sallam even the people who were enemies of islam when they would come and visit the prophet sallam and go back they would tell their people we have seen the biggest emperors of this world but we have not seen any people who would literally do anything for their leader like the people, these Sahaba, these companions would do for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like he would do wudu and people would run to catch the water which was dripping from his hands. People would do things like exactly like one time there was, there was um, a, 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 the people uh, traveling in a um, uh, much later after the Prophet Sallallahu there was a group traveling from an area and when they were traveling, one of the, the leaders of the Muslims, he, he said, just wait and he went on the side uh, of this place and he sat down as if um, he was answering the call of nature, but he didn't. Um, and then he came back. He didn't like use the washroom, but he went there. He sat like that and came back. And people asked, oh, why did you do that? He said, when we were passing through here, the Prophet Sallallahu um, used the washroom at this point and he went there and I wanted to follow his footsteps. And I want to like, even though I didn't need basically, like it's to that level. Uh, and they, they didn't have to do this, but this is the kind of this is like this is not a part of the deen. You don't have to follow this and everything. But this is the level of love that they had. One time, uh, there was a on one path there was a tree, and uh, before and there were branches were hanging out. And whenever the Prophet Sallallahu would pass through this, he would like tilt to one side so that the head when he was riding a a, a, ride, a, a ride a camel or a, a horse or something, and then he would turn to a side so that his head would not hit the branch. And much later in the lives of one of the Sahabas, this tree had already been cut down, this path was clear. But whenever he would pass through that particular point, he would tilt to one side because the Prophet ﷺ used to do that. You know, the, that's the kind of love they had. But not just for the Prophet ﷺ, even amongst each other. They were not the Ansar and the Muhajirun, the kind of love that they had. The Prophet ﷺ established Muakhat between them, that every Ansar would host one Muhajir. And if we think of ourselves, how many of us would be willing to open the doors of our house for any refugees that are coming to our, our area? Oh, come and live in my house. I'll give you half of my property. I'll put half of the property in your name. I'll give half of your my money to you, uh, right? And I'll, I'll give you all of this and, you know, like whatever I'm earning, half the money I'll give to you and everything. How many of us will do that? None of us will do that, right? But they did it willingly. And the people who they were fighting with, the people who had killed each other's family members before, they became like brothers and such a strong brotherhood as well. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us is this, this, uh, this love, this is there. It's a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This this thing, this uh, feeling amongst you for each other, for people in the deen is a big, big, big blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So preserve your unity and do not waver in your commitment and dedication to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this and Allah ta'ala says at another place in the Quran that even if you were to spend all the wealth you have, you cannot create love between the two of you. To create the love between two people, who can create love between two people? 
who can create ulfat between two people, who can create softness and gentleness and everything and care for each other between two people. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hearts, as long as we keep trying by ourselves, sometimes we um, we want to try by ourselves. We're like, yeah, Allah, um, you know, like, okay, I will do this. Maybe I should try this, this. Maybe I should try this, that the other person will understand. And, you know, they'll be a bit more loving. They'll be a bit more caring. And not, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. What Allah ta'ala is teaching us is, who remember who controls the hearts you can spend all the wealth you want we can and we have seen this in our lives as well we can do so much for some person we can like bend over backward for somebody we can change our whole life for somebody we can sacrifice as much for somebody we can spend all of our money on somebody we can spawn, spend all of our time and energy on somebody and yet when we need some care we'll see nothing we'll see nothing right and then be like i did so much for this person and this is how this person repays me. And, and that's a lived experience uh, with many different relationships that many of us have, right? What Allah Ta'ala is teaching us is this love that is there between you. This love is a blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you were enemies and Allah made friendship between you, put, put his love between you. And by extension, Allah Ta'ala is also teaching us that if, uh, you know, that um, if we want to create between love between us and somebody, you know, like our family members. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Jabbar. Al-Jabbar. One of the meanings of Al-Jabbar is the one who mends, right? And some relationships that that seem to be breaking or that, that seem to be broken, Al-Jabbar is the one who can fix them, who can fix those relationships. Al-Jabbar is the one who can fix the hearts. He can put ulfat where it doesn't seem like it, uh, it, it might seem like this is hopeless. This is not going to work. This person is so cold. This person is so thing. I do this much and they they that's how they they do. They don't do this and they don't do that and everything. And we can go on that tangent and Shaitan will build it up in our minds. He'll make us live and relive and relive and relive and relive those same narratives that we tell ourselves and everything. And and a lot of it might be coming from place of truth as well. That okay, this is our lived experience. But but one thing is there when we look towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created friendship between people. He created ulfat. He created love. He created mutual care and love and bonding between people. Such strong bonding where enmity used to exist. So when any of us is experiencing something in our lives, in any of our relationships, whether it is between a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, two brothers, a parent and a child, any kind of relationship that we have in which we are feeling this um, this friction, we are feeling this like sadness, we are seeing, seeing this like lack of uh, bonding with each other, lack of total lack of perspectives with each other and everything, no matter where we are. One thing that we are learning is we can never give up hope. Right. Yes, we do only what we are able to do. We cannot we cannot push our we cannot like um, give to somebody more than what is the right of that relationship. We give whatever we can and we we, we have to all we all have multiple responsibilities and everything. And our biggest responsibility is towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do that to all other relationships. We do what we can and we keep following. We keep asking Allah ta'ala for guidance. We keep following the guidance. We keep doing whatever we can the best at a certain time. And, you know, um, th there's a quote by my Angelo who says that do the best you can and when you know better, you do better, right? So when you know better, you do better. So um, as and Allah Ta'ala will keep teaching us better, okay? And then as we learn, we keep doing better. But despite all of it, and that's what uh, takes us back to, to the work as well, that we keep doing our best, like we keep tying our camel, but our hope is still in Allah. I keep doing my efforts, but my Hope is never on my efforts, and that's what will stop me from frustration as well. That my hope is not on my effort. That means that if my efforts are not bearing fruit, I won't get frustrated because my 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 reliance was not on my effort anyway. My effort was for the sake of Yalla, I'm trying. Yalla, I'm trying. I'm trying to the best of what I can. Show me, show me something more, and I'll do something more. Show me something more, I'll do whatever I can more or differently. Sometimes it's not doing more. Sometimes it's actually doing less or something, doing something differently in different relationships. But then, at the same time, knowing that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the one who can and who will create. He created love and uh, bonding between people who are enemies. He can create love and bonding between me and any of my relationship that I'm struggling with. 
inshallah we'll stop here it's it's the half of the ayahs is still left and may allah ta'ala help us to understand these ayat and there's a there's a lot more to it and i i don't want to hurry i don't want to rush it so inshallah we'll continue with this ayat the next time so um uh, may allah ta'ala make us of those people who hold on tightly to the rope of allah subhanahu wa may allah ta'ala never ever in our lifetime or at the time of our death help uh, you know let let this grip get loose may allah ta'ala make this grip only tighter for us may allah ta'ala help us to have stronger and stronger and stronger hold to the rope of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because uh inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi we, be, we belong to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to him we are going to return and this is and we need to return to him we need to hold on to the rope to return to him may allah ta'ala keep us together for his sake may allah ta'ala never let us um, um may allah ta'ala never make us of those who create division uh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us jamaat uh, has the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, loves people who connect together, who don't who don't divide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves people who unite. May Allah ta'ala make us of those people who unite. May Allah ta'ala make us of those people who create unity, who facilitate unity in our families, in our communities, in our all ummah. May Allah ta'ala protect us from disunity. May Allah ta'ala protect us from divisions. May Allah ta'ala protect us from anything that breaks us away from his deen. Just like Allah ta'ala united us as sisters in Islam in this world, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us as sisters in Islam on the day of judgment under the shade of his throne when there will be no shade except his. And then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannatul Firdaus. Uh, Allahumma ameen. May Allah ta'ala uh, I, any goodness that has come from this talk or any talk anytime is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's the owner of all goodness. Any shortcoming is mine and mine alone because I'm human beings. Op I'm a human being open to mistakes and always open to mistakes and may Allah ta'ala still forgive us and still accept this, even this broken effort for whatever um, whatever we were able to do, may Allah ta'ala accept it from myself and from anybody who listens to it today or at any point um, later that may Allah accept us, make this a means of increasing our iman and getting closer to him. Ameen ya rahman rahimeen. Subhanaka Allahumma. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka. Wa natubu ilayk.